start this recording. You probably all heard the recording in progress pop up. So we'll be recording this for posterity. Uh, I've introduced myself and Rebecca's going to introduce herself in a moment. These are, this is our local leader roundtable produced by Amoeba, the American Independent Business Alliance. Uh, we're having these calls to bring our leadership around the country in the bi-local movement together to share best practices, to get to know each other, um, to hopefully help grow the movement by, by sharing with each other and, and building that community. Uh, Amoeba is a member supported organization. So this call is one of the many benefits that are part of being a member. Uh, if you're not a member yet, I would certainly encourage you to consider it. And I'm happy to chat with you or pass you along to the appropriate person uh, to talk about that. Uh, we rotate these calls. Uh, we do three different types of calls on the second Thursday of every month except December. Uh, we have nuts and bolts sessions, kind of a pre-selected topic that's a practical use type of thing that we do kind of a deep dive into. Uh, we do uh, what's going on with Amoeba, so updates and relevant information about Amoeba as an organization and, and you know new things coming down the pike or developing, et cetera. And then something that we call the Hive, which is, uh, we kind of liken that to the cocktail hour after a day of programming at a conference. So we can kind of Get to know each other. So, so this is a hive, and it is um, so it's an informal thing, more of a discussion, so we can pick each other's brains. But we do want to hear from some folks uh, to who who have experience to kind of get us started down this path. So that will include Rebecca, as well as Marianne, and I did uh, send an email to Mariah as well. Mariah might be joining us uh, a little bit later as well. So with that, wait, let me check my remarks. Anything else I need to say? I don't think so. <laughs> so <laughs> let's see, Rebecca, should, do you want to introduce yourself first or should we sure. turn it over to sure. Marianne or how? We'll, we'll I'll there. introduce myself and then I'm going to turn it over to Marianne. So Sounds I'm Rebecca Malalson and I was a uh, founder and uh, of the Austin Independent Business Alliance over 20 years ago and was the executive director for 10 years, but I left about a year and a half ago. So April, welcome. I'm so glad to see you here. Um, and I now am on the board of Amoeba and I, with two, along with two partners, run the Local Business Institute, which is a national nonprofit, but I'm loving my work with Amoeba and happy to share whatever knowledge, experience, insights, big mistakes I made, <laughs> anything. Um, with everybody here for sure. But first, um, I'd like for Marianne to go first. So I'd like to introduce Marianne Miller, who is uh, with a, is the Stay Local Program Manager uh, in New Orleans. And I know New Orleans has lots of experience in getting city funding. And I've always been amazed at the stuff that y'all have done. So um, Marianne, you want to take it away and tell us about some of your experiences? And then I'll come back and talk about Austin a little bit. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, Amoeba. I'm really excited to be with all of y'all today. Um, the relationship that Stay Local has had with the city of New Orleans for this specific um, type of funding that I'm going to talk about predates my experience here. It's um, over five years of an annual contract that we renew. Um, Stay Local has been the Independent Business Alliance of New Orleans since 2005, 2004, 2003, um, it's a initiative of the Urban Conservancy. So when you talk about our positioning with the city of New Orleans, we um, do have, uh, you know, potentially a little bit of a different setup in the sense that we are under an umbrella of another organization. But the uh, agreement that we've entered into with the city of New Orleans has always been a stay local. So I think for apples to apples comparison, it's fair to, to move forward with that thought. And, and, and stay local is a longtime Amoeba member. Um, Dana Ennis, our executive director, has been on the Amoeba board. So looking at this in terms of like how you can see, you know, maybe the age or the, or the, the relative health of your organization, I don't think is as important as looking at sort of how this came to pass five or more years ago and where we are today. So I, I won't take too long, but I wanna make sure to hit those points. So um, the 
agreement that we have with the city of New Orleans is a cooperative endeavor agreement. So on the order of where we are formally, you know, it's it's on the less formal side. Um, the uh, opportunity to enter into this agreement came from really a responsive position and the uh, extent of our services to the state of New Orleans has always remained sort of the same, but it's kind of by design and it's a good situation. So we currently provide outreach and marketing services to businesses that are in a position where they are experiencing a shock. Oh, thanks. Uh, where they're experiencing a shock or stress or um, some sort of uh, difference based on a planned improvement that the city of New Orleans has, has uh, scheduled. So planned and scheduled, those are the key words, right? The city of New Orleans may hold a um, you know, public uh, event, uh, five to six o'clock at this church at this time, because we're going to do some road improvement in your area. Well, no one sees that. That is not top of mind. And the business owners in the affected area are the last, sometimes they feel like to hear about this, right? And so rather than entirely ask the, the, um, the entities that schedule and, um, and plan for these improvements to change how they are, um, that, that's really, that's a little bit too big of a disruption for the internal proceeds at City Hall. So instead, State Local had an opportunity, there was a, a well-known stretch of New Orleans uh, neighborhood commerce, Magazine Street, uh, there was a, a very um, well-loved uh, few blocks that were ex exceptionally disrupted by road work, by road improvement. And there was the sort of, um, you know, pop-up, pop-a-mole effect of all these business owners trying to reach their council person and they're this and they're that. And it was like, boop, 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 boop. So bringing the problem to the attention of the, the public officials is more of what Stay Local was able to do. First, we were being asked to help. And then we were able to say in a, in a also responsive way, because this had already started, look, we're going to put together a proposal. We're going to approach economic development. There's got to be a way to manage the messaging better. And so that started our multiple years of having a contract renewed. It's never been more than $20,000. Um, it's been lower than that. Right now, we're in a mid-year contract that started because of budgets um, and things with COVID. It's only made in December for $13,000. So that was done sort of on almost like a, you know, a, a what it would be like if it were a full year rate. Um, and so what's important about that is we, we have dealt with more than one mayoral administration. We've dealt with um, mostly the same people at the, at the, at the heads of the city departments. Um, but our funding has come from the Department of Economic Development. And so economic development is able to say, okay, these are shocks and stressors specific to business. We need to be able to tell business, we, we are responding to you. And rather than the whack-a-mole response way, it's, it's now we're able, because of enacting this agreement and continuing it, it's, it's that we're in front of it. It's that we can tell businesses ahead of time. This is what's happening. These are the dates. This is the approximate length of time. Um, that information was probably always there, but with technological tools, it's, it's much easier for people to access. Um, what I think is distinctive is that even though our source of funding comes from the Division of Economic Development, the work is really structured and scheduled and the proposals are all years in the making from the Department of Public Works and some utilities companies. And those are notoriously difficult folks to get to. Um, and they have comms teams, they have communications teams. So it's more for our partners at the city economic development division to be able to peer to peer communicate with their comms teams, then give us information that we can then go and run with. Um, it's, it's interesting because initially there was, you know, sort of a, uh, you know, a, a review of, a, a, of the early year of our work was, you know, make a formal presentation to city council, explain what you did. We created a valuable asset. It's about a 20, more than 20 page um, road construction toolkit. It's, it's um, you know, it's written so the audience directly is the business owner. Like if you find that, okay, the work is underway and it's not going the way it was described to you or that you need to negotiate with people who are on site performing the work. You know, it has a very specific breakdown of some things to do. Um, it talks about signage, it talks about other city agencies that could be a partner in um, mitigating some of the stress and shock that the road construction will have for the business owner in a neighborhood commercial district. 
Um, and so we've moved from the initial, show us what you did, show us you know, what, this, um, what the service contract outcome was, which was the 23 page guide to just ongoing improve outreach, continue to create assets. And really what we do is we treat the business owners in the impacted area as though they were a stay local member business. So we elevate them to that, that way of treating them in terms of everything about how, how visible they are, how often we post about them, what we share about them. Um, and so that's a little interesting because you know you can almost look as on another tier of, of working on this is how many businesses do you end up converting to annual members um, from these relationships? And I'll tell you the number is low. Um, that's not why we do it, but also it's just interesting that, that the number is low. But it's everything from things, like I say, like developing assets and just getting ahead and individually and directly contacting the business owners and letting them know that we're here if they just need to, to toss out a question, to um, advertise underwriting on public radio that just says, um, you know, carefully, but audibly so that people can understand what we're saying, uh, you know, while this street is, you know, while streets are closed in name of area, remember that the following businesses and that we name them are open for business, you know, aren't interrupted, still have their hours, whatever it is that would be really similar to like even a holiday campaign, but we do it during the period of time that the construction is going on. As you can imagine, um, with our hundreds year old infrastructure, there is no end in sight to this. But we are seeing that the city is formalizing this relationship. So we've had, you know, annual sort of like, let's go back into negotiation. Your wording and your contract is very flexible. Outreach and marketing communications. Uh, should we tighten that up? No. Okay, great. Here, you know, we'll, we might change the dollar amount, stay local, but here's the contract. Let's sign it. To last year, we were asked to respond to an RFI. Nothing came of it, but it was sort of like a, a temperature check of like, hey, you know, if we ask you to provide documentation and credentials, can you do it? And this year, there's definitely an RFP. It's coming out in the coming weeks, and it will be awarded in 2022. And we think that the formalization of the of the structure might just it might just be on the city side that it's going to save staff time because if they award us three years, hopefully we're the the selected right. team. It, you know, it does cut down for them, and they do have. Um, they do have protocols for supplier um, for supplier identification. So, Marianne, that was great. And I remember when y'all came out with the um, the book on road work. It was impressive. Thank and you. So anybody on the call who wants to take a look at that, I'll drop it in the chat. Have a great. If you haven't seen it, definitely uh, not just look at it, study it because it's really really well done. Um, I'm going to jump in and be super quick. Uh, at AIBA, we were uh, very successful at getting quite a bit of money from the city, but it came through multiple channels. So we um, got hundreds of thousands of dollars um, a year uh, in, in some cases, but every single thing is based on relationships. So build those relationships, find, find your champion on your city council who will go to bat for you, um, make friends with department heads, that's something that took me too long to understand um, because they can uh, totally help you or totally thwart you one way or the other. We received money in three different ways. Um, one was economic development money. And that's where relationships really help because delving through you know, uh, city documents that can be measured in feet thick. Uh, is is tedious and time consuming and sometimes you read it and you still don't know what it said but having an advocate making a friend of someone who will tell you like hey this money's coming up and it's this program and it seems like y'all might be able to fit in there somewhere um, is a huge asset the key to that and other city programs I at least for me was they're not there to support you as sad as that sounds and as we don't want to hear that they're there to achieve their goals. So when you can find a way to make your organization help them achieve their goals, that's where you get their money. And if you position yourself that way, think of it, it's just sales. I spent you know 30 years in sales. So it's, it's not, here's what we do and here's how important it is and here's how wonderful it is and here's how good we are at it. It's, oh, here are your goals for this program. Here's how we can help you achieve your goals. 
And that's when the purses at City Hall started opening for me, when I went in with that kind of approach. Um, there are, uh, so there's within that, uh, under economic development and other departments, there are also sponsorships. Um, all these departments have uh, marketing money and they can spend it on sponsorships. And once you bring to their attention the value of local business, which we shouldn't have to bring to their attention, but unfortunately, sometimes you do. Um, it behooves them to spend some of their marketing money uh, attracting that audience and looking good to them and, and positioning them some, themselves well to them. We had the Austin Energy, we had a municipal um, energy company. So we have Austin Energy and the permitting department, which had a really bad reputation. Both did $25,000 to $50,000 sponsorships with us per year. And I, I never do luncheons for people because nobody comes. You know, your members can smell it a mile off and they just won't come. But in terms of just distributing their materials and you become a spokesperson. So they did some focus groups with local business um, members to figure out what they needed and what they wanted. It was just a great relationship. Um, so that's that sponsorship is really good. Contracts are good. And uh, Marianne Bravo for turning something into a continuing contract. The, the good and bad of contracts is, yes, you can bid on them, keep an eye on it. You can sign up at, at your city uh, as a vendor and get those. The good news is um, once you get one, it's totally breaking into it because once you get one and you do a good job for them, they will come back to you again and again. You'll be a known entity with a known quality, and that's what they like. Uh, it's getting that first one that's the hardest. Um, the, the downside of that is you will likely see all kinds of RFPs for bidding for things that you look at and you go, we could do that, or I could do that, but you can lose yourself in them. And I always was pretty harsh at asking, how does this benefit my members? And if I couldn't answer that question, I didn't bid on it. And it's tempting because it's usually huge amounts of money and, it's, they're not that hard. I always found that I expected so much more out of us than the city ever did. So, but it is a good source. I, I did do a couple of contracts when AIBA needed money and thought, okay, this does help our members too. So we'll, we'll jump in and do it. Um, one area that you may not be thinking about is tourism dollars. Um, all cities have some form of a hotel occupancy tax. And in, it's different in different states, but the state usually legislates how that money can be spent. And it can be spent to attract tourists, but it can also be spent on cultural tourism and directing tourists to go to local businesses once they're in town. Um, we at one point got a $200,000 um, grant off of the hotel occupancy tax. The unfortunate side of that is that it is all hugely political and we lost it before we got it because I disagreed with the mayor on a vote on something that my members wanted and he yanked it back. It was pretty ugly, but but it's there and in other cities going back to that relationship, relationship, relationship. Um, uh, at the time, and it was by choice, AIBA was uh, very focused on advocacy, which is political. And so you're kind of, you know, holding out both hands in a way saying, well, we want you to support us and give us money to do these things. But we also have a voice that you may not agree with. Um, if you aren't as political as we were, you're much safer with those contracts. But that's a choice that everyone makes. So um, poke around and, uh, and look at what's available. I think the two key things that I would say are make friends everywhere. Um, ask, go, go to the to the permitting department and ask how you can help them uh, serve local business better. You know, going back to what Marianne said, I've never understood how a city the size of Austin, with the kind of budget they have, they are the worst communicators on the planet. And you think you guys could just hire amazing people for marketing and messaging, and they just don't. And they're so bad at outreach that it's a natural opportunity for anybody on this call um, who represents an audience to, 
to be, and there I think the key is to be a trusted voice, not just say, sure, I'll send your email out, but to help them understand that your members trust you and they trust what you tell them. And so it's coming, the message is coming to them from a city that um, unfortunately they largely don't trust or you, which they largely do trust. So um, that's just a, a quick and dirty, how we did what we did and, um, and how we were able to break down some of those barriers. A really odd, unexpected thing that happened is once we got the first big sponsorship contract from Austin Energy, um, I knew the people in the permitting department pretty well. And there was this little kind of competitive edge. It's like, well, we want what they have. How much does that cost? And who knew that city departments would act like, you know, children? Um, and so I said, well, here's what they're doing. And here's what we're doing for them for that. Is that something you would like? And they're like, we want what they have. And that was more often than I would have thought. So um, don't assume that they're big professional adults. Um, and on that note, I would like to introduce uh, Mariah McKay, who I see Mariah is on the call now. Mariah, I have always called you the director um, of the Spokane Independent Business Alliance, Simba. But when I was looking at one of your emails, I saw, is this a new title that you have or did I just miss it for all this time? I love it. So introduce yourself with your new title because it's fabulous. Hello, everyone. Uh, sorry to be a little late to the call. I had a critical family conversation this morning over here on the West Coast. Um, but glad to hop in at an opportune moment. Um, this I'm already getting little reminders and stimulating thoughts out of what Rebecca has offered. So thank you. Um, I'm the director of dynamism for the Spokane Independent Metro Business Alliance. Um, I'm the founder of the organization, been working on it for the last four years, and I used to be the executive director. Um, but a little sidewinder about why I changed my job title. Um, <laughs> Basically, we all know what it's like to try to do the job of five people. It's not sustainable. Um, it will run you right into the ground. You'll become irritable and less than fun to always work with or be around. And um, that's no way to you know, win hearts and minds and attract people to your entity. Um, and, and I knew I needed help and we were being successful enough that we had the resources to grow. So I was able to uh, recruit a very talented um, essentially a co-director. And initially, um, this is a, a biracial, uh, light-skinned lesbian woman who, like me, is neurodiverse. Um, and she was a business consultant in our community, um, had grown up in poverty and worked in social services and uh, ran for city council, actually. Um, and I helped to recruit her to run for city council, uh, helped support her during her race. And then when she didn't win for a variety of reasons, which I could see that was going to happen, um, then I offered her a job at my organization and um, wanted her to become the executive director. And she came back and said, actually, I don't wanna be the director either. Uh, why don't we do a horizontally organized, um, you know, mutually managed kind of team collaboration? And I thought, you know what, that's, that's perfect. Um, that's exactly what our mission is about. If we're promoting worker-owned cooperatives um, as a nonprofit organization in the social benefit sector, why don't we walk that talk as well and have a horizontally managed kind of staff-driven approach to the work? And so we are like the nonprofit equivalent of a worker-owned cooperative. Um, and we actually have been reaching out to other organizations that are trying to um, you know, instead of this hierarchy of executive director, program director, you know, program, you know, coordinator, assistant, associate, all this kind of, you know, rank order titles for duties within an organization, um, we wanted to have a more customized job title that spoke that spoke to our what we bring to the work and to the mission. And so she chose as her job title emergent strategist. And I don't know if anyone um, is familiar with this, this work here. I want to see, I see nodding, I see smiling. Yes. Um, so this is the book that inspires my new coworker um, and what she brings to Simba. And so what we basically did is we took all of our internal operational functions, internal programs, external programs, and future programs, 
and put our name across the spreadsheet and said, you're leading on this one and I'm leading on that one and we're co-leading on this one and, you know, lead, support, 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 lead, <clears throat> you know, between us and another third person we're hoping to bring onto the team um, from contractor to staff. And we designed role descriptions instead of job descriptions. And um, basically, you know, now we're, a, now two of the three of us are people of color, which is important for organizations that are granting to BIPOC predominant groups. Um, and so, yeah, we've, we've kind of transformed ourselves, but there's something you might hear more about in the future and it's called a uh, symbiotic enterprise. And that's the name for the nonprofit management model that we're trying to implement at Simba. And with a small team and as a newer team, it's easier for us to adopt these practices um, and you know understandings because we, we don't have 30 years of institutional pattern to break and overcome and change. So we're just like ducks diving into the water. Um, but that's not what we're here today to discuss. We're here to talk about uh, re building relationships with government um, organizations. And in our young history, uh, Simba has contracted both with um, our local municipality, uh, with our county government and with our state government, actually. Um, and like Rebecca was saying, um, the relationships start early and often. Um, I was only able, so I guess the first big government contract we received was a CARES Act um, budget, um, which ultimately the first installment was $300,000 and the second installment was a bonus round of $125,000. So we had a total project launch budget for our buy local campaign of $425,000 that wow. all had to be had to be spent in um, like three months, basically, start to finish. So that was insane. Uh, <laughs> Um, as a sole staff person organization, but I was, you know, I had a lot of relationships in my community and I was able to turn to our members and um, hire a lot of contractors with specific expertise to spin up three components of this campaign. And so we had a consulting module where we offered drop in business classes uh, for how to pivot during the pandemic and how to navigate, you know, hiring um, law in our state and so on and so forth. And we had um, we created a business directory and an online marketplace uh, to help businesses that didn't have an online presence be able to market remotely and facilitate, you know, call in and email orders and other ways of connecting with customers. And the campaign was a smashing success. <laughs> um, we had a huge we had a huge marketing budget. Um, we launched with 480 businesses on the marketplace, and now we're up to 700. Um, and Gosh, there's there's a lot that's going on behind the scenes there, and I'm happy to answer questions. Um, but we built a regional brand that's different from our organization's brand, uh, which is actually strategic um, because we want the community to own the brand, even though we're behind the scenes, the you know the fiscal agent, the, the lead organization that's you know implementing the campaign pr primarily. Um, we're leveraging a lot of other in kind participation, both from partner um, business associations and from businesses themselves that are incorporating the cam campaign brand into their marketing and outreach. Um, so we were able to parlay that into getting resources from several state organizations. Uh, we got a $30,000 grant from the Washington State Microenterprise Association to do market research about how the pandemic was impacting small businesses. Um, and we got that grant because we showed that we have, you know, a service provision relationship with all these businesses that are being hardest hit by the pandemic's impacts. Um, so we were able to do some interesting surveys and basically they paid us to make a case for our next <laughs> grant project that we want to pitch to them, which is amazing when you actually get paid to do your own program development work, right? Like how often does that happen? <laughs> not often um, enough. <laughs> not often enough. Amen. Um, and so we have all this great data and now we're using it to propose um, a local dollars loyalty uh, rewards payment system that will be offered in network to businesses participating in the campaign. Um, and so we have a, a technology partner and we have credit union partners and we've selected one to move forward with. And we're actually very excited to 
be this close, probably three to four months out um, from launching a minimum viable um, closed payment network. So what we're trying to do is save small businesses on credit card processing fees. And our system, because we're a nonprofit, we can you know, operate it at cost and um, we can save them 1% right off the top. Um, you know, less the corporate rates that Visa and MasterCard and Square are charging businesses. Um, that, and those costs keep going up, you know, as a percentage. Um, it's really harming many of our members. And so um, with the credit union integration, what we want to be able to do is get people's checking and debit accounts within a credit union to transfer into the loyalty payment program. Um, so people load dollars from their checking account onto their local dollars account and those transfers are free because they're internal to the financial institution partner. And so we can save 3% on each of those transactions from the perspective of the business. And so that business, so Simba can pay ourselves out of those savings. The business can pay the customer out of those savings. So people have the experience of getting paid to shop local. Um, so that's a really exciting um, initiative. And there's things like, you know, credit union foundations that actually um, fund these kinds of, you know, they're, it's called FinTech, financial technology uh, projects to um, strengthen, you know, the, the cooperative, because so, credit unions are co-ops, right? And that's part of our mission is um, <laughs> to take the profit out of the banking industry and, you know, have it be more of a nonprofit um, distributed ownership model. Um, so anyways, uh, we were able to then get a massive state contract through, and I, if your states don't have a program like this, I would suggest you advocate for one. In Washington, it's called the Small Business Resiliency Network. And our uh, State Department of Commerce is actually um, contracting with small, um, small business alliance and membership-based organizations to provide outreach and technical service around, you know, pandemic response. Um, and so they started with, you know, 16 organizations and, oh, by the way, because I used to work for the director of commerce when she was a Senate majority leader in our legislature, I was her legislative aide. I was the first one to get the call to be invited to receive money for that contract. Um, relationship. So, <laughs> relationships, ding, 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 ding. relationships. Exactly. And it was actually, this is, this is just to show you, um, not a small world, but about to the point of relationships, it was her husband who works for the city of Spokane as the council's attorney who gave me the call on the, like a couple of weeks ahead of when they announced the CARES Act money and said, what could you do with $150,000? What could you do with $300,000? And I was like, well, shit, I better come up with an answer to that question, you know? And so he tipped me off and got me ready to apply before anything was publicly announced because we have this political alliance behind the scenes. Um, and, you know, you can say, oh, you know, you'll do better if you're moderate and you're not as political. I, I disagree with that. I only have the opportunities that I've won for my organization. I've only been able to hire coworkers because I am political and clear about my values. People join Simba because we have progressive values around investing in people and being better stewards of the environment. Uh, we have an intersectional racial justice lens that we um, represent proudly and engage in education around. You know, it's not something to shy away from. Um, and, you know, there was a point when we first started um, where there were, uh, I'm just this, I don't, I don't, I don't want to throw anyone under the bus, but you know what, I'm just going to say it. Um, there was directors from Amoeba who said, you shouldn't include race in your mission because that's going to scare away members. And I said, you know what, that's not why I'm starting this organization. <laughs> I will quit this organization if racial justice is not a part of our mission statement. Um, and so we proceeded and it served us very well. Um, <laughs> you know, so you, if you understand the landscape you're operating within, um, you can, you know, do things that people didn't think were possible. Um, because in too many spaces, uh, people on the left aren't engaged in business circles, right? Yep. And so in my community, that is a uh, um, critical, you know, the Venn diagram, <laughs> that's a critical place for us to be in the middle um, where we are, we have progressive values, but we are 
an association of business owners. Um, and so we can actually propose economic policy um, that is compatible with the agenda of our progressive majority city council. Um, you know, now there was an example where we, um, in my private life, I campaigned for a mayoral candidate who wanted us to apply for uh, planning department outreach dollars to do neighborhood uh, canvassing to help a community, the community um, come up with a re-envisioning plan for freeway lands that were seized by eminent domain in a predominantly BIPOC neighborhood and um, figure out how do we get the Department of Transportation to turn this land back to uh, people of color led community organizations and then build affordable housing that they can run in perpetuity as an organizational asset. Um, and that would have been a really cool contract to work on, but our, our candidate, our mayor didn't win. He lost by 857 votes. And the mayor who did win is a Republican. And um, we had a proposal to do some work with our um, health officer, with the health district, actually doing site assessments for COVID risk in small business environments, you know, restaurants, small scale mm -hmm. factories, you know, we actually had a um, software from a local university that modeled the floor plan and could calculate, you know, where there was too many bodies in proximity to each other. And like, and we have other members who are occupational safety assessment specialists. And this could have been a great contract for, for those members to participate in this project. Well, it didn't move forward because, you know, the mayor put the nicks on it because we're not on her team. And that's okay. We don't lose any sleep over it. We, you know, we just keep putting in the bids and we keep spinning up the projects. And honestly, um, we created a whole coalition called the Business Equity Coalition of the Inland Northwest or Beckin Coalition for short. And it, you know, tie, and this is a subset of our Live Local Coalition, right? So the Live Local Coalition is the buy local, uh, the nine organizations that are part of our buy local campaign. And that's industry groups, mostly in the arts, um, neighborhood business district groups, and um, other demographic chambers. Um, and, you know, Simba as an IBA, we are none of those things, right? We're an independent business alliance like all of you. Um, and so we were the natural convener of all these other types of constituents to create the Live Local um, Coalition. And then within the demographic chambers, we created the Business Equity Coalition, right? Because the industry groups and the neighborhood business districts don't necessarily have uh, racial justice and equity is one of their core mission components, but these groups do and did. And so now, you know, Simba is helping them participate in our regional SEDS planning process, the, you know, community economic development planning, whatever, you know, what it's called. Um, and we're able to put our finger on the scale in a way that we couldn't before because we weren't internally organized. Um, we weren't able to speak up to, you know, the white establishment. Um, and it's and now foundations are throwing money at us because we created this vehicle to have these conversations that are long overdue, and we didn't have the the internal um, consistency and, and like agreement and plan to voice the concern you know voice the real structural issues that have to be overcome. So now we're gonna go to the Department of Commerce and say, hey, we'd like eighty thousand dollars to fund a study on um, business equity in Spokane County, and we'd like to pay all of our coalition partners to do outreach into their communities, to collect stories, to collect data, to measure the, the scope of the disparities in business ownership, um, business profit margins between different demographic communities, um, spatial distribution of where these businesses are located in our city. You know, can you have a, a desert of BIPOC businesses just like you can have a food desert? The answer is yes, but no one's even ever tried to measure that before, right? Um, and so we want to create that work for ourselves because that's how we get to propose our own solutions for how to over overcome those um, issues, right? And um, then we can actually practice business equity instead of just paying a bunch of lip service to it. Um, so it's, it's just, I could talk obviously all day about many of these projects, um, but I'll just stop there and see where the interest of the group, if there's you know, questions or where you'd like to drill down deeper, or like more detail. Well, Mariah, that's, you are always such an inspiration, not only that you were able to get this money, but the programs that you do with it are just amazing. And 
it seems like every time I talk to you, you blow me away with something that you've done. But I know that we have other people on the call, like Jennifer, for instance, has I know uh, gotten some funding from her community, and so is Colin. And uh, Jennifer, I'm going to turn this back over to you because we just have a little over 10 minutes left, and I'm sure people have questions, and so I'm going to let you direct it from here. Sounds good. Well, I. I don't have a lot to add to that conversation, but if you want to chat about, uh, we do have a, a city contract and we also get funding uh, through applications to our Metro Council. And then we have also done contract work for our Metro Council people. So, you know, just a variety of ways to engage with the city um, to accomplish your goals and their goals and where that intersection is, is always great. Um, I do wanna bring up just one uh, from the chat, sorry. Oh, to, is it reasonable from Stephen to ask for serious dollars to offset the impacts of street closures for months on end that devastate local business? I think anything is reasonable these days. Um, I think that, uh, does anybody want to chime in on that question? Uh, I know Marianne is certainly the expert on uh, street interruptions. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, it, I mean, it just depends what form it takes. Uh, you know, it's just too complicated to get into, but locally, I think some of the, the federal funds that trickle down are not going to end up being used in the ways we would have hoped. But what I will say is it's just ongoing. So because of the pandemic's potential to um, impact Mardi Gras and because Mardi Gras evolve, uh, strongly relies upon uh, public service in the form of police, there is a potential that businesses would be impacted because businesses who count on a certain amount of their revenue coming from Mardi Gras parades, literally passing in front of their door, might those routes may change. So we would actually propose accessing um, the marketing support in a totally different way, but also through those federal funds. So it's strange to think that Mardi Gras, which is, but it does connect back to what Rebecca said about tourism. I mean, the reason we're going to have it in 2022 is because there's no chance that we can continue to survive with the gap in, in visitors that we've had. And so by hook or by crook, we're going to do it. So does that mean we may need to change routes? Yes, everyone would absolutely, you know, that's, that's a baseline. But what does that do for the business owners is what we're negotiating right now. Marianne, maybe if you want to, and Mariah as well, if you don't mind, and Rebecca dropping your email address into the chat. That way, folks that have, you know, kind of specific questions about, you know, kind of the different areas that you guys focused on, because it was such a the whole rainbow of just it really was ways. And I love that. I love that. Um, that would be lovely. And let's see, um, some other questions for I see Ajax. Hey, Jack dropped one into the chat beyond government or folks developing relationships with other anchor institutions. And anybody want to speak to that? Um, I just put in the chat, but I'm especially seeing that in cities uh, where with anchor institutions in terms of procurement issues. There's so many cities that are now trying to figure out, I mean, they're scrambling especially to at least be seen or hopefully actually be supporting businesses owned by people of color and procurement is seen as one of the key ways to do it so the anchor institutions some of them if you can especially if you can help them build a community around that kind of support are eager for the training for the best practices around how do i do business with small businesses that are local um, they don't necessarily like they might have the impulse to do it, they don't necessarily know how. And I think that's where local first organizations can be super supportive in a way that is not necessarily consumer facing, but still really impactful. Yep. All right, the so floor is open. Go ahead. We, we actually um, got really ambitious in trying to punch above our weight and applied for a uh, Small Business Administration Community Navigator Grant. And we didn't just apply for one, we actually applied for two. So we, there was the tier one package that we did with ASBC and Amoeba, and then a partner with, you know, other partners within our two coalitions we've created did a local tier three. Neither of those came through, but for the tier three application, um, we basically worked with our local community foundation as the hub. Um, so that's an example of an anchor institution partnership. And 
they are actually, so Simba successfully now, I've, I've expressed frustration with the crowdedness of the ecosystem in my county on these calls before. And I'm really happy to now report back that we're going to merge with one of those organizations uh, next year. Um, so our LGBTQ chamber and Simba are going to merge into one super organization um, as of Q3 next year. And I know um, you're like, well, why don't we work closely together? Why do we all have to have our own, fly in our own little flags and be so scattered? Um, so this is a rare example of partners actually being able to merge to build capacity. Um, but all of that's happening through the, the kind of coalition building that we've been doing in the background. I also forgot to say we are applying for ARP funds. Um, one, to fund the organizing to set up our local dollars network for the Live Local campaign. And the other proposal is basically a straight ripoff of AIBA's um, IBIS districts program in Austin, Texas. So we're going to be pitching the city on um, having Simba be a contractor to run a uh, Live Local districts program. <clears throat> And that would formalize our support of working with our neighborhood business district partners and in incorporating their events, their, you know, their businesses into our live local platform in one place where visitors can actually discover it. Marvelous. Um, I see Lauren commented as well. I would love a, an Amoeba Roundtable on nonprofit mergers. <laughs> Maybe that's a topic for another local leader roundtable because Yes, I think we all feel them? sometimes there's so many, <laughs> so many. Oh, and Ellen responded with a, a book about this particular topic. So excellent. Let's check that out. All right. Well, I don't know if you're like me, but my head is spinning a bit with all the different ideas that I've jotted down. So I'm really looking forward to Rebecca's notes so I can process this a little more thoroughly um, off call. and. So glad to be building this community where I can reach out to uh, any of these folks and uh, benefit from your experience. So just a reminder, um, I do, when you see me looking down, um, I'm uh, not playing solitaire. I'm taking notes on everything because I do write an article about each local leaders roundtable, And then we put the video up online and put an article in the next newsletter, which will be out next week. But the article is always on the website under member news and uh, keeps everybody, you know, with some links and gives everybody a nice wrap up of those ideas. And uh, we won't have a local leaders roundtable in December because we figure everybody's super, super busy in December and it's a good month to sit back for a bit. But Jennifer and I are going to get together and brainstorm ideas for next year. So if uh, you've been on these calls and there's something you'd like to see, I just note, made a note of nonprofit mergers um, and uh, send it, just email it to one of us and we'll include it in our list of things we're doing next year. Thank you all, this was great. Awesome, any other burning questions we have before we wrap up or thoughts to share? I have a point of concern that applies to the entire network. And that is last night, I went to a business networking function for our regional lifestyle magazine. I got it, the, the 20 under 40, you know, mm -hmm. thanks guys. That was really nice. While there, I was talking to another award winner who's the CEO for the Spokane Valley Chamber of Commerce, which is a mainstream big business chamber. And he told me that he was really jealous that we started the Live Local campaign and had all this success with it. And he thinks that Amazon has already won and um, if you can't beat them, join them. And he's been in talks with local Amazon representatives who are trying to create a local marketplace, an Amazon branded local marketplace where they feature only local businesses. So fucking Amazon wants to try to scoop the niche we've carved out for ourselves. And I think this is an existential threat to what all of us do and we need to be prepared for it. And if you're not already, you know, I mean, you, you, I put the website for our campaign in the chat. It's not a sophisticated, we don't get between the customers. We can't track the total number of sales um, like Amazon does. Um, and we're certainly not in the business of under underpricing those products you know, for our own profit, obviously, but um, because we don't have the sophistication that Amazon does, our, 
our tool is a very modest intervention. You know, it's like David flicking a pebble in the face of Goliath, but we, we have to figure out how to build this capacity and try to own the space so they don't also own what we should be creating but aren't. Does that make sense to everyone? I think that's something that somehow we need to have a strategic conversation about and figure out when they're gonna launch this because they have millions of dollars to throw at it. They could just put us all out tomorrow, you know? And the community, I don't think is educated enough to be like, well, hey, they're helping local businesses. What's wrong with that? They don't understand the deeper monopoly issues um, and antitrust issues that some of us are aware of. So I'm, I'm really concerned about that and be interested to get reactions for what other people think. Well, thanks for bringing that up, Mariah. And we all should be concerned about it. And two things, one, uh, they won't do it well by our standards because they're not people oriented and they're not community oriented, but you're correct. So many people are, what's the price and how easy can I get it? Um, oh, and they'll put out a big campaign saying, we love local business and we support them. Um, part of this is, I think we have a two-part job. One part is a campaign that rallies against that, that says, but here's what they do to a small business. Um, they're already doing it. They're just going to do it with a different label on it. The other part is that um, the Local Business Institute working with Amoeba had put together a program for Amoeba to do a local marketplace that encompassed all of our members. Um, we included it in two different grants we applied for. Getting federal money is really difficult. It's much more difficult than getting city or, or county money. We didn't get either grant, and now we're uh, stepping back and reassessing and looking at private funding for it because the time is now, the need has been here, um, but it it can't be Amazon. It needs to be us, so we're working on it. And any any we, we are working with a Kentucky wide nonprofit and doing the second iteration of a multi vendor e commerce site, and. Uh, one where um, people would buy directly through the website uh, as opposed to going to each individual's website when they're interested in the product. So they can buy from three stores with one basket, et cetera. I do know that uh, Community Ventures, the name of the nonprofit, you know, is will be launching that statewide, hopes to bring it nationwide. But I also know that Community Ventures is teeny tiny compared to Amazon. So um, there's a lot of movement in that area. I don't know yeah. what to say besides keep the faith and keep trying. <laughs> and yes, the ILSR, you know, the more we can educate the public about why Amazon no bueno would be best. So um, I'm sorry, Lauren, go ahead. No, no, I, I was just thinking we've, we've been having these conversations internally. We get approached by businesses that want to do this all the time. And, you know, we're, we have a very high trust um, factor that needs to be met before we'll partner with somebody. And I'm, I was, I've been asking um, my Amoeba contacts if anything's been happening with getting a networked e-commerce, local e-commerce platform going because all of us doing all of that work on our own seems really crazy because we're up against the monster. <laughs> So I appreciate that you all are applying for those grants and, you know, I'd love to be in any further conversations about how we could all do this together because yeah, it's something needs to happen. Great. And I love that. We just need to be our own monster. Yeah. A local monster um, of a different sort to fight off. The Many headed Hydra. <laughs> there you go. There you yes. go. I was just looking at Mariah's comment about like not having the capacity to really think about the national policy issues because you're so focused locally. So I'm just sorry, I'm throwing a bunch of things in the chat, but there is a national organization that was founded in part by ILSR that Lauren put that is working on the national issues. And, you know, it allows you to email your congressperson and send a thing out to your business owners to email their congressperson all about this antitrust legislation and trying to shake some of Amazon's power away. I just and, and they think, thank you, Ellen. I'm sorry I didn't mean to interrupt you, but they, um, their team leads um, every other week conversations and updates about all of this work, which is so helpful for me to hear everything that's going on in that 30 minute call. And here, I mean, it's just, it's huge. So I would definitely encourage anyone concerned about Amazon to sit in on those calls if you can. Yeah. 
Yeah, we struggle with capacity as well, but they do make it as easy as possible. But I, I will also say that I have also struggled with doing everything that I want to do with that issue. So yeah. just more reason for building capacity with our city funding. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, everybody. We're at 203. I wish that if we could stay on another couple minutes, we could just solve this Amazon thing. But I know that we won't do that today. Um, so please stay in touch. Uh, let us know of your questions, other ways to connect. Um, we're happy that this is this is our strength is, is each other and, and our connections here. So uh, thank you all so much. And we will see you in January. We will be in touch before then. Uh, to let you know what we're up to and please 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 send us your ideas because you know this is the more community generated these roundtables are you know the better they're going to be and the stronger we'll end up because of them so thank you all have a great, great day. day thank, thank you. you thank you for coming safe Bye -bye. and happy holidays to everybody you too Bye -bye.